Yes, dear, I'm wearing my pants. They can't see, but I do have my pants on. I don't feel as confident as I would otherwise. Well, good morning. Uh, we're both a little punchy because uh, uh, we've both been up since around four this morning. Uh, I had one of my uh, very, very uh, early in the morning uh, uh, Chinese workshops. I'll have another one this afternoon around six o'clock. So I'm a little, a little punchy, okay? Uh, but uh, this morning, I went to uh, do something I probably should have done a million, million years ago. Uh, but uh, I'll start off by saying, back in around 1970, uh, maybe 69, but I think it was 1970, uh, I was uh, studying at the Lee Strasberg uh, Film and Theater Institute in uh, Los Angeles, in Hollywood, okay? And uh, those are my sort of my Hollywood years because I was recording uh, at CBS, uh, CBS uh, Studios uh, in, uh, on Sunset. Uh, for my uh, recording career, I guess. Uh, and at the same time, I was studying uh, acting with the, at the Lee Strasberg uh, Institute. And so I was spending a lot of time in Hollywood. And of course, I was getting starting to get interested in uh, 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 mystical things. Uh, and uh, in uh, one of the convocation ceremonies uh, that I attended, the Rosicrucian Order Amorc in Long Beach that I was a, uh, a member of at the time, one of the lectures, one of the master's lectures, uh, actually used the term magic. And uh, it was sort of like a sermon, a convocation message that uh, that yeah, using mind uh, mind control or self uh, mind power type things uh, that people can affect real changes in their lives and improve their lives and things like that. And uh, part of the one of the phrases was uh, in ancient times, people called this magic, and my ears just sort of lit up and goes, yes, it is magic. And we are walking around the temple here in, in cool looking robes and strutting around in the dark and lighting incense and ooh, magic. Okay. So uh, one afternoon after uh, my classes at Strasbourg, which took place right on Hollywood Boulevard at the time, uh, directly across the street from Fredericks of Hollywood, where I would often window shop. Uh, and, uh, but right down the street, not too far away, I, uh, on uh, Sunset, uh, was Gilbert's Bookstore. And it's one of the oldest and most venerable bookstores uh, esoteric kind of bookstores in Hollywood and been there since I believe the 20s. And uh, so I went in and I bought two books. The DeLorence edition of The Sacred Magic of Abramel and the Mage and the Castle edition of Magic and Theory and Practice. And the, this is that castle edition. I've got the sacred magic upstairs. But anyway, it didn't have this uh, star on it. I, I drew that on there. And it, had a, and it didn't have 
me and Mickey Mouse ears inside the Star of Babylon on the back. I did that too. And just for the bibliophiles out there, the this was what the inside looked like. Magic and theory and practice. No date. But it had to be uh, printed sometime in the late 60s. This is where I learned magic. It's the primary book most people of my generation first went to when they tried to find out what the hell Crowley was talking about. And after reading the book, they were even more confused about what the hell Crowley was talking about, except the little tiny bits that they actually digested. I use this book over the years. Uh, there are thousands, literally thousands of my own annotations. It is falling apart. I used it uh, when uh, writing um, the magic phallus to Crowley and all sorts of other things. It's near and dear to me. It's, it's a precious thing. But at the very beginning, uh, Crowley describes what magic is in the most authoritative way. He wrote this uh, over a number of years, but uh, he primarily wrote it while uh, at the Abbey of Thelema in uh, Cefalu, Sicily, uh, during the early 1920s. Now, if you know anything about Crowley's life, this was a wild and crazy time, an experimental time, where Crowley's experimenting not only with, uh, with magic and mind-expanding and mind-accelerating uh, drugs, uh, but he was experimenting with uh, the teaching of, of Thelema. This is after the Book of the Law was uh, uh, received in 1904. And he was experimenting with the, the social or group aspects of, uh, uh, of Thelema. And so it was a wild and crazy little beautiful, wild, odd cult in Sicily. He eventually, Mussolini eventually kicked him out. But uh, most of that magic and theory and practice was dictated uh, at the Abbey of Thelema, uh, which explains why uh, uh, many passages in it seem to go on for several pages without punctuation. Because Crowley was uh, uh, really experimenting with uh, the the spiritual effects of cocaine at the time. As a matter of fact, he got people, uh, uh, the Abbey of Thelema, he treated sort of as a, as a health clinic to get people off of, uh, off of heroin. And he, and he succeeded in doing that, but uh, he also succeeded in getting them <laughs> transferred to cocaine for a while. Uh, anyway, this, it starts off with a quote from the Lamegaton or the Goetia. Magic is the highest, most abstract and most divine knowledge of natural philosophy. Advanced in its works and wonderful operations by a right understanding of the inward and occult virtue of things so that true agents being applied to proper patience, strange and admirable effects will thereby be produced. Whence magicians are profound and diligent searchers into nature. They, because of their skill, know how to anticipate an effect, the which to the vulgar shall seem to be a miracle. Now, I'm going to skip over a bunch of things because I want to uh, uh, 
get to Crowley's uh, actual definition of magic, or at least begin that. He starts off that, this section with uh, an epigram from St. Paul. Prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. And then a quote from the Book of the Law. Also the mantras and spells, the obeya and the wanga, the work of the wand and the work of the sword, these he shall learn and teach. He must teach but he may make severe the ordeals. The word of the law is Thelema. And that's from the book of the law. Uh, okay. This book is for all. And I have to sort of share the format. This book is for all. And then you go down and you see magic, all, magic, all, okay? Kind of gets it in your brain in a fun way. This book is for all, for every man, woman, and child. My former work has been misunderstood and its scope limited by my use of technical terms. It has attracted only too many dilettante and eccentrics, weaklings seeking in magic, with it, just with the sea, an escape from reality. I myself was first consciously drawn to the subject in this way. And it has repelled only too many scientific and practical minds. Such as I designed, I most designed to influence. But magic is for all. I've written this book to help the banker, the, the pugilist, the boxer, the biologist, the poet, the navy, the grocer, the factory girl, the mathematician, the stenographer, the golfer, the wife, the consul, and all the rest to fulfill themselves perfectly, each in his or her own proper function. Let me explain in a few words how it came about that I emblazoned the word magic upon the banner that I have borne before me all my life. Before I touched my teens, I was already aware that I was the beast whose number is 666. Now, let me digress for a second. If this were a novel, would you now want to turn the page and read on? I love this opening. Before I touched my teens, I was already aware that I was the beast whose number is 666. I did not understand in the least what that implied. It was a passionately ecstatic sense of identity. In my third year of Cambridge, I devoted myself consciously to the great work understanding thereby the work of becoming a spiritual being, free from the constraints, accidents, and deceptions of material existence. I found myself at a loss for a name to designate my work. Just as H.P. Blavatsky some years earlier, theosophy, spiritualism, occultism, and mysticism all involved undesirable connotations. I chose therefore the name magic as essentially the most sublime and actually the most discredited of all available terms. I swore to rehabilitate magic.
to identify with my own career and to compel mankind to respect, love, and trust that which they had scorned, hated, and feared. I have kept my word. But the time is now come for me to carry my banner into the thick of the press of human life. I must make magic the essential factor in the life of all. In presenting this book to the world, I must then explain and justify my position by formulating the definition of magic and setting forth its main principles in such a way that all may understand instantly that their souls, their lives, in every relation with every other human being and every circumstance depend upon magic and the right comprehension and the right application thereof. And again, that magic, 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 and all are in that kind of a formatted uh, format. Number one. Definition. Magic is the science and art of causing change to occur in conformity with will. And he gives an illustration. It is my will to inform the world of certain facts within my knowledge. I therefore take magical weapons, a pen, ink, paper. I write incantations, these sentences in the magical language, as an example, that which is understood by the people I wish to instruct. I call forth spirits, such as printers, publishers, booksellers, and so forth, and constrain them to convey my message to those people. The composition and distribution of this book is therefore an act of magic by which I cause changes to take place in conformity with my will. So that's a definition of magic and an illustration. Part two, postulate. Any required change may be effected by the application of the proper kind and degree of force in the proper manner through the proper medium to the proper object. That's the postulate. He gives the illustration. I wish to prepare an ounce of chloride of gold. I must take the right kind of acid, nitrohydrochloric and no other, in a sufficient quantity of the adequate strength and place it in a vessel which will not break, leak, or corrode in such a manner as will not produce undesirable results with the, necess with the necessary quantity of gold, and so forth. Every change has its own conditions. In the present state of our knowledge and power, some changes are not possible in practice. We cannot cause eclipses, for instance, or transform lead into tin, or create men from mushrooms. But it is theoretically possible to cause in any object any change of which that object is capable by nature. And the conditions are covered by the above postulate. And the postulate again is, any required change may be affected by the application of any proper kind and degree of force in the proper manner through the proper medium to the proper object. Sounds pretty dull, but you can't argue with any of it. Part three, theorems. Every intentional 
act is a magical act. By intentional, I mean willed. But even unintentional acts, seeming so, are not truly so. Thus, breathing is an act of will. Two, every successful act has conformed to the postulate. Do I need to repeat the postulate? Any change? Any re required change may be affected by the application of the proper kind and proper degree of force in the proper manner, through the proper medium, through the proper object. Every successful act has conformed to that postulate. Every failure that one Every failure proves that one or more requirements of the postulate have not been fulfilled. There may be a failure to understand the case, as when a doctor makes a wrong diagnosis, and his treatment injures his patient. There may be a failure to apply the right kind of force, as when a rustic tries to blow out an electric light. There may be a failure to apply the right degree of force as when a wrestler has his hold broken. There may be a failure to apply the force in the right manner as when one presents a check at the wrong window at the bank. There may be failure to employ the correct medium as when Leonardo da Vinci found his masterpiece fade away. The force may be applied to an unsuitable object, such as when one tries to crack a stone, thinking it a nut. Fourth, the first requisite for causing any change is a thorough and quantitative and quant qualitative and quantitative understanding of the conditions. Illustration. The most common cause of failure in life is ignorance of one's true will or of the means by which to fulfill that will. A man may fancy himself a painter and waste his whole life trying to become one, or he may really be a painter yet fail to understand and to measure the difficulties peculiar to that career. <coughs> Five, the second requisite for causing any change is the practical ability to set in right motion the necessary forces. Illustration, a banker may have a perfect grasp of a given situation, yet lack the quality of decision or the assets necessary to take advantage of it. Number six, every man and every woman is a star. That is to say that every human being is intrinsically an independent individual with his own proper character and proper motion. Seven, every man and every woman has a course depending partly on the self and partly on the environment, which is natural and necessary for each. Anyone who is forced from his own course, either through not understanding himself or through external opposition, comes into conflict with the order of the universe and suffers accordingly. Illustration, a man may think it is his duty to act in a certain way through having made a, uh, made a fancy picture of himself instead of investigating his actual nature. For example, a woman may make herself miserable for life by thinking that she prefers love to social consideration or vice versa 
One woman may stay with an unsympathetic husband when she would really be happy with an attic, in an attic, with a lover. While another may fool herself into a romantic elopement when her only true pleasures are those of presiding at fashionable functions. Again, a boy's instinct may tell him to go to sea, while his parents insist on him becoming a doctor. In such a case, he will be both unsuccessful and unhappy in medicine. 8. A man whose conscious will is at odds with his true will is wasting his strength. He cannot hope to influence his environment effectively or efficiently is the word. Illustration. When civil war rages in a nation, it is no condition to undertake the invasion of other countries. A man with cancer employs his nourishment alike to his own use and to that of the enemy which is part of him. He soon fails to resist the pressure of his environment. In practical life, a man who is doing what his conscious conscience tells him to be wrong will do it very clumsily at first. A man who is doing his true will has the inertia of the universe to assist him. Illustration. The first principle of success in evolution is that the individual should be true to his own nature and at the same time adapt himself to his environment. And that's where I'm going to leave this today because it keeps getting better and there's quite a bit left. Anyway, that's where we'll stop for today. And because I've got my pants on, I'm now going to take my morning walk, which I miss because of my uh, workshop. Anyway, I got another workshop at 6 o'clock tonight, so I have miles to go before I sleep, so I'm off to the coffee shop. Till tomorrow, continue to be good to yourself and be good to each other. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law, love under will. And don't forget... Every man and every woman is a star. And when you're doing your will, you have the entire inertia of the universe behind you. See you tomorrow.